Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. One of the most dramatic chapters in the history of 19th century Europe was the Paris Commune of 1871. The Commune governed only for a short time. Here are a few policies they advocated for. Equal pay for men and women, help for the homeless, free schooling and legal services, recognition of foreigners as full citizens, abolition of child labor, workplace democracy. And what was the outcome of the citizen revolt and revolutionary government of the future? Well, mass execution, a city burned and a blood-soaked week of revenge. There's an interesting story here. Let's discuss. Well, hello, everybody. We are, we are back again with another podcast, and we have a, a good friend of, of Greg's, uh, Jeffrey Fox, or Jeff Fox, and you are in Spain right now, correct? That's right. In uh, the city of Car Carbonero, is that, it's on the coast? Carbonero. It might be a little an exaggeration to call it a city. It's a, it was a former fishing village. It still is a fishing village, um, right on the edge of the sea. And would I would I assume hmm? would I assume if you looked out your window you'd see the ocean? Let me see. Yeah. Can you see? Let me see. I I can open the. Uh, Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my! Well, you not you don't you don't see the ocean. The ocean is very far away. You see the sea, the Mediterranean yeah. Sea. Uh, the o the ocean would be the Atlantic, which is on the other side of Spain. Oh goodness! And your wife is an architect, so I'm assuming you're living in pretty good digs then, too, correct? Yeah, she, she designed this place, and I I got to uh, to. Uh, it, tell her exactly what I wanted. And so I have a, the perfect, perfect space for, for my writing and, and, you know, deliberating and meditating and so on. Well, t tell me a little bit about yourself. You, you grew up in Chicago, is that right? Well, I was born in Chicago and uh, uh, actually went to grade school in LaGrange, which is a, uh, which is a suburb. I know LaGrange. And, uh, and, and high school in, uh, in Lake Forest, which is a northern suburb of Chicago, yeah, yeah, and and then school in school in uh, Harvard, and you're be you're a sociologist, is that right? Yes, yes. I okay. Um, very briefly, yes. Uh, I we had a, a small high school, public high school, but an extraordinarily good one. I mean, the the uh, the principal. Would, would go around to uh, college graduations to recruit teachers and we ha and and by god we had um three of us went to harvard from this little from this little school right uh, oh actually two, well two girls went to radcliffe and i went to harvard and um uh and and we had a couple of guys went to princeton so i mean this was quite a success for a small public high school i yeah. i know i I know Lake Forest. I used to live in Waukegan. It's a beautiful, beautiful suburb, and yeah, like yeah. you said, extraordinary schools. So, um, and, and then you, you you took your sociology, and your first book was um, uh, you've primarily written about Central and South America, correct? Right, mostly Latin America. Yes. What happened was, uh, as I was about to graduate from uh, from college, uh, I had been specializing actually. And I was taking uh, government, which is what they call political science, uh, because they Harvard expects their people to govern. <laughs> so, uh, and um, I was specializing in the African independence movements. So I wrote my thesis on on Guinea, Guinea Conakry. Then they, I was I was very I was very excited about that movement at that time. Um, but uh, as I was about to graduate, I, I didn't you know I. I couldn't figure out, find a way to, for me to get to Africa, that uh, you know, um, Peace Corps or what, whatever. So, but but some people came to the to college, recruiting for a project in Venezuela. I had never studied Spanish. I didn't know anything. You know, uh, I I knew something about Latin America simply because I read the newspaper. That's all. 
you know. Um, but uh, anyway, I, so I got accepted into this program and became a, uh, what they called a volunteer working in very poor neighborhoods of, of Caracas. Uh, and after that experience, I really figured out, I really needed to figure out what, what was that all about? What is going on? I need to study sociology. So that's what I did. Right. And it's interesting. I've, I, I did read your, um, I did read your book, A Gift of Sultans. Oh, you did? Oh. I did. And I, I, it, it was when I when I read it, I told Greg, I said, this guy's going to be fun because the book is it's interesting. You talk about politics yeah. and sociology, but you're a novelist, right? You know, you, you write in you, you write yeah. in fiction and your one book, The Contra, I, I didn't um, country. I didn't read that, but I read excerpts of it. it's a series of short stories. Right. And, and you start as if there's a tour guide saying, here is our tour. And then the tour is the 10 short stories. Right, right, right. And, and again, that was, this is all fiction. And yet you yeah, make yeah. your point through that. Well you, well, you know what happened, Pat? I was writing, I was teaching sociology and basically teaching some of the same courses over and over again. Um, and um, writing, you know, articles in sociology and so on. And I was pretty enthusiastic about it, but there came a point when I thought, well, you know, to really understand the experiences of the people that I'm talking about, I have to try to enter their lives. Right. I have to try to imagine myself in their situation. And the way to do that was, of course, I created fictional characters very closely based on, on people I knew uh, or, or who I knew existed. And, um, and again, you know, writing. So for, for me, Fiction is another way of doing sociology, actually. Right, and that's the case for this book, which yeah. was uh, you know six hundred years ago, and you have the Christians and the Muslims, and and their the, the conflict between the two, right. and um, and it could be pick a conflict, <laughs> you know. Well, well, you know, well, you know what really got me excited about that? Well, it was two things. One of it, my uh, my architect wife really wanted to see Santa Sofia in Istanbul. And so, so right, right after I'd, I'd finished my book, Hispanic Nation, which is actually my best-selling book, but that, that's pure sociology. That's no fiction in there at all. Um, and I, we just finished that. We went, we went to, to Turkey and I was blown away by you know, what we saw there and the layers of history that you can actually see in the architecture. You can see, you know, well, there were, there were these Greeks, <laughs> there were these, you know, all these th uh, this, uh, things piled one on top of another. Um, and then, at, this was also at the time of the Balkan Wars, and Sarajevo was besieged. And by God, here is this cosmopolitan city, Sarajevo, of uh, many creeds, people working together, uh, being bombarded by absolutely intolerant Orthodox, uh, you know, Christian or uh, Serbian Orthodox, you know, masses who hate, many of whom who just hated cities. They, they, they didn't like the idea of urban life that was like was corrupt and so on. And I thought, my God, but this is sort of what was happening in Istanbul 600 years earlier, but in reverse, it was the Christians being besieged by the, by the Muslims, not the Muslims being besieged by the Christians. And so, so that was re really what, uh, what gave me the emotional power to keep going on that book. Well, that's why I can hardly wait to, uh, this is not your book, this is just the cover of your book because it hasn't been released yet. And this is a book called Rabble. Ra I'm assuming that's what we go, Rabble Rouser. Right. And it is a book about the Paris communes and it'll be released in a month or two. When will it be released? Well, they're, they're telling me now, September 28th is gonna be the official publication date. It possibly, it may, it may, the, the, we may have an ebook bef available before that. I'm, I'm waiting to hear from them. Okay. Okay. Good. And I, Greg, um, when we're thinking of different people to have on the podcast, he said, well, I have this friend in Spain. He's writing a book on the Paris communes and, <laughs> and it, but it's a non, it's a, it's a fiction. And I, yeah, I hate to admit it. I, 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 I went through four years of liberal college in Eastern Illinois University. And I knew, uh, uh, I heard the word Paris Commune. I didn't know anything about it. Uh -huh. And so the fun of 
getting ready for your for this podcast and interviewing you is spending time i literally read massacre by uh, john merriman from yale and you know went through old photos and learned about this and i realized this is one of the biggest events that's happened in the last 150 years this is this is like a powerful catalyst to so many things and uh and it keeps on getting revisited and and that's and as i'm reading about this i'm realizing you know i'm just i'm an idiot for not having this on my radar so tell us a little bit about what happened 150 years ago in Paris. And I mean, there, there's so many people who have written about the commune, and a lot of them use it just as background to, to write some other kind of story, a mystery story, a police story, or something, you know, and it's, it's like a costume drama. Um, my book is, is not that at all. It's really an attempt to understand the dynamics. How did this happen? Uh, and unlike almost anything else you'll read about it, it takes really takes the point of view of workers, several workers, workers in different trades, because it really made a difference which trade you were in. That, that made a difference in, in terms of what your relations were with, uh, to the boss, uh, the, the hours you spent, uh, and you know how much freedom you had to think about other things. Um, okay, so, well, wait, wait, st stop right there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm assuming that people are as ignorant as I was about this. So we need to back up and say you had 1871, you had Napoleon's nephew uh, was kind of in charge and there was a conflict between Paris and the uh, Germans Paris. at that, that time. Russia, Russia, Russia. R a Russia. Fra the French Empire was one of the greatest in, in the world at a time when the world was pretty much dominated by empires. Right. I mean, uh, the, 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 the two biggest ones were the British and the French. Uh, they were all over. I mean, they, they had enormous colonies in Asia, you know, which, as we know, because uh, Vietnam, and <laughs> Cambodia, all that. Um, and uh, Africa, um, you know, a, a huge part of Africa, about a third of the, the continent. Uh, in America, in, uh, in uh, well, they had some small islands in the Caribbean still. Uh, and uh, they were a financial powerhouse. Um, and so they were one of the, one of the key imperial empires in an imperial system, you know, uh, jockeying with all the other empires, Austro-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, <laughs> uh, Belgium had a big empire in, 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 in Africa, Holland had, you know, Indonesia. I mean, even, even smaller countries had enormous empires. Uh, so this was, it was, a, it was a time when, and the Europeans felt, well, they had the right to invade all the non-European places because they, they were the legitimate, they, they were civilization. These other people were all uncivilized. That was their view. Um, and, um, uh, and and the, the the French one was so basic. Well, well what was happening then was that uh, the Germans did not yet have an empire, and they wanted one. <laughs> so <laughs> they wanted to have one, <laughs> and um, so uh, the uh, they basically provoked France into declaring war. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a b bunch of tricky maneuvers and also certain fake news like there was a fake telegram and so, so on where it looked like look, looked like the uh, Prussian king had somehow in, insulted the French ambassador to provoke the French to go to war. Well France, <laughs> the French Empire was at that time governed by uh, the nephew of the great Napoleon and he, he also used the name Napoleon so he was Napoleon the uh, third and so France went to war. They, 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 they did disastrously. They, they went to war with enormous enthusiasm. They were sure they were going to be marching into Berlin within a week. And no, that didn't happen. Uh, they got, kept getting defeated over and over again, uh, lost huge numbers. And, you know, you, you probably know that uh, the, the, the Prussians kept advancing and they actually besieged Paris. They, they had it entirely encircled. 
and they, they, you, you couldn't get any food in. You couldn't import food from the countryside. Um, so, I mean, people were really starving and they were bombarding the city. Um, and after the desperate uh, defense, well, but one of the things that happened in, during the defense of Paris was they realized, well, we're, if we're gonna defend Paris, we need more troops. We're going to have to arm the people. So they enlarged- National, National Guard. National Guard. So the National Guard, which is kind of a, like, it was a civilian militia. And, um, and, and, and so, I mean, ordinary working people, they're, 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 they're mobilized and a lot of them were eager to take up arms. They wanted to fight the, 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 uh, the Prussians. But what had, what had happened was the war went so badly that uh, the empire, the emperor himself surrendered personally to the king of Prussia. He handed over his sword. This was an enormously, this was enormously embarrassing to everybody in France. Um, and, and so he was taken prisoner. So, okay, well, now we have no, so back in Paris, they're saying, we should, we, now we have no empire, emperor. So what are we gonna do? We can't be an empire. We're going to proclaim the Republic. So once it was a Republic, then the, the working people who had been in opposition to the empire all along said, well, now we can defend France with a clear conscience. We're, Cause we're not defending the empire. We're defending our country. They never liked, he was kind of a buffoon. They never really liked Napoleon III, right? Well, he, he, no, he, well, he wasn't a buffoon, but he certainly um, did not have real good judgment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and um, so- well, well, one, one more thing. Uh -huh. This is the time of the industrial revolution yeah. and automation. And so all of these farmers which typically would have had good thriving lives in the countryside, found themselves pushed into these urban cities, London, Paris, and- Yes, yes. There had been very heavy uh, migration into Paris right. from surrounding right. small towns. Uh, and um, these people were making a living. They were not farming. Uh, right, right. But uh, uh, all kinds of handicrafts, uh, and, uh, and some heavy industry, um, bronze making, bronze was extremely important, um, uh, the chemical industry, uh, and, uh, and of course, clo the clothing industry, which is which uh, most of the workers were women. Gloves. Um, gloves. Shoes. Glo gloves and, and, and all kinds of clothing. Um, shoes, well, the shoemakers generally were men. <laughs> but the other clothing work makers were usually were women. Um, and uh, one of the industries, but anyway, just because people may not know the, the sequence of events, what happened was Napoleon III surrendered to the King of Prussia on September 2nd, 1870. So the war had only lasted a few months. Uh, it was defeat after defeat. Okay, and large parts. So, so, so large parts of what had been the French, the French army, or armies, because they had plural armies, were taken prisoner, and they were in prison camps in uh, in in Germany, or in in the uh, northeastern part of France, which which the Prussians simply occupied, and they took it over, Alsace and Lorraine, and um, then. So, but but the war continues, um, and uh, the, the the those 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 soldiers who had not been <laughs> imprisoned, are, they're, they're still fighting, but they're still losing. And uh, but the people of Paris continue to defend their uh, city, and one of the things that they did was they had subscriptions to pay for the cannons, so they asked people to you know. To, Offer to pay money to, uh, uh, to, to for the cost of a cannon. They made the can the cannons were made of bronze, and the bronze cannons they, they weren't they weren't as powerful. They didn't have as, as long a range, or uh, uh, they couldn't uh, fire as heavy a, a charge as the steel cannons of the Prussians. But they had a lot of them, and um, and they were and they made all these cannons, and they defended Paris. Pa Paris was never taken by the Prussians. All of northern France was, um, but they got to Paris, and that was as far as they got. 
And, but, but after what happened in, but finally, after this heavy siege, a very cold winter, an extremely cold winter, uh, and people are running out of wood. They're chopping down the trees in the parks to, you know, to, to burn, <laughs> to keep warm. Uh, they're, they're, they're eating anything, old horses or cats, dogs, rats, <laughs> you know, um, and they're, they're making coffee out of acorns or whatever they can, you know, and they're really suffering. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, on January 28th, the uh, government, which had said it was always going to fight to the very end, it would never surrender, surrendered. Which meant that they that 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 government, so-called government of, Nash, of national defense, lost all its prestige. So, at that point, the uh, the working organ working class organizations, including the international, including what what was organized as a new uh, committee, a central committee of the national guard, uh, and there were all these political clubs. Uh, uh, many of them with revolutionary ideas, and they had been talking about creating a commune for a long time. And I said, well, now we'll do it. We have to create the commune. And so they were really restive. The, um, so the, the government, the national government is still, you know, now subject to the Prussians. You've sort of surrendered. So you can't really, and, and the Prussians are imposing a huge reparation sum. And who is going to pay for it? Well, people in Paris, because that was where the money was. Right. Said, what? You know, we haven't had any jobs for months. You know, you know, we haven't had enough to eat. And now you want us to pay the Prussians? You know, uh, it, was, it was just too much. And uh, the, the city was so restive that this, that the, uh, th this, Remaining national government at, at, at Prussian insistence, the uh, the French national government held new elections, and very a very conservative group got got elected. Uh, in fact, they were monarchists. These were people who wanted to restore the king. Oh goodness! Uh, Going back you know, to that, they go back to the Boer Bourbons, and of course they couldn't agree because there were two two different groups of of uh, proposing two, two different lineages of bourbons and then there were the people who wanted the bonapartes to come back so there, there, there were these three different monarchist groups and but they were in the majority in the senate and um, and what what the government decided to do well wait a minute we can't we can't control these people in paris and they're armed <laughs> you know uh, what we have to do let us, we're going to take the cannons and we're going to turn them over. We'll turn them over to the Prussians because we're, we're giving up our weapons to the Prussians. Well, let, let, we have to seize those cannons. So they, they, they made a couple of attempts to do this and they were frustrated each time because people would gather around. No, you can't do that. So they, they, the, the first, first couple of attempts were totally frustrated. So then finally on um, Saturday morning, March 18th, 1871 that we're gonna we're gonna sneak in there they, they they get they get their troops organized and roused out of bed at three in the morning it, it's dark it's cold it's raining <laughs> it, it's awful <laughs> you know and they say and you guys be as quiet as possible we're going to march into paris and we're going to take those fucking cannons we're going to get those cannons and um they uh you know and they well, they didn't get very far, and actually, I, I tried to I tried to give a sense of what this was like in the novel. You know, people see them, and they start screaming, and they, they run to the they run to the, the churches and they say, "Ring the bells! Ring the bell! Ring the toxin!" You know, <laughs> they they they're coming for our cannons. We can't we can't let them get away. We paid for them. They're our cannons. You know, um, and by get they get uh, the the main the main uh, park. Full of cannons, where, where, where the largest number of them were, were up on the top of Montmartre, which is this quite high hill in uh, in northern Paris, in the 18th arrondissement, and um, they get there, and they they get there before the alarm has really gone out, but they don't get very far before all of a sudden all these women, like women, they've gone out because the women tended to go out very early in the morning to buy hot bread. 
because it was, you know, fresh bread, you know, so they, they saw them and they scream, you know, and they're coming and they're screaming and then their men come out and some of the men, men have had time to get into their National Guard uniform and some of them haven't, but they're all there, you know, and the kids are there and they're all gathering around, wait, wait, you gotta stop these people. And the soldiers didn't know what they were supposed to be doing either, because here are these soldiers, they're fighting for, for the supposedly the national government and they've been, they've been told that they should take weapons and extra ammunition and they have to be wondering, wait a minute, the war is over. The Prussians won. And we're told to take extra ammunition. Who are we supposed to shoot? French people? Uh-oh. <laughs> they did not, did not want to do this at all. OK. But their, their generals and their, and their uh, colonels and their captains are marching them up, you know, and, and they march up the hill and they have orders to seize the cannons. They grab them. The women come and they grab the arms of the guys. And, and the guys say, well, wait a minute, this is a lady. I'm not supposed to hit her. You know, what am I, you know, you know, it was a huge problem. And uh, then the, uh, some of the generals say, wait a minute, you guys take aim and fire on those people. And the soldiers are looking up and say, fire on them? Are you kidding? Because, and some of the soldiers, in fact, knew personally these people because to save money, when, when they had brought back prisoners of war that the Prussians released, some of them were housed <laughs> in the working class districts because it was cheaper. And so they, they knew some of these people. They said, wait, wait, we're supposed to shoot them. No, no. And so what happened was, I prob probably one soldier started it. He took his rifle and turned it upside. He, he reversed it so that it was butt end up in the air. And the other say, yeah, that's what we do. So they all, you know, they turn up, they turn their rifles up, so indicating that they were not going to shoot anybody. Uh, well, this, uh, you know, there, there is not, nothing is unanimous. Of course, there were there were some soldiers who did fire. There, there were there were some some people defending the cannons who were were killed a few, but for the most part, the soldiers just wouldn't have take any part of it. And in fact, they actually dehorsed the general who had been commanding them to do this and another another general had shown up in civilian clothes but he was recognized and he was and he was remembered as having uh, been the author of a massacre in a previous revolt and they grab these guys and they arrest these two generals the soldiers not the communards not 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 the national guard but the but the but the regular army <laughs> and they they rush these people off into a into a, a house in uh, up up in on Montmartre, a, a regular humble peasant house, and uh, by God, eventually those two men were shot by their own their own men, um, <clears throat> for which of course the commune was blamed. The commune was blamed for murder of the generals, but but the commune actually hadn't done it. And that kind of started. That was the sort of official. Okay, we're we're on our own here. We are right. we're. Right. And you know, Jeffrey, the the interesting thing about this is this is the birth of photography, 1971. You look at the you know the Civil War, and, and I'll link in our in our notes here. But this is the first time they you know you see the pictures of the cannons, you see the right. people, you see what Paris looked like for the first time. People were really able to not only have the story, but have a um, photography. And then later the painters came in and this became right. something they did a lot. So this is- Yeah, and, and also what you get was the first um, photo faking. People Photoshop, uh, they, they would get these, take these photos, they put somebody else's face on, 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 uh, on one of the characters. And, you know, depending on what on what side they were on, but, but they would do this either to denounce the, the commune or, you know, the first deep fake. Yeah. Yeah, they call yeah, it. A deep, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and of course, the painters were free to invent whatever they wanted to. So they've gone through this horrible winter. They yeah. have a lot of these troops that were brought in as these National Guardsmen. But now they have these loosely organized troops. And you have to they, remember that the, that the that the French army that they had that they assembled for this. They were all losers. They had never won a battle. You know, they had, they had lost a war. A lot of them had a lot of them had been prisoners until a, a week or so earlier, 
and the Prussians allowed them to be shipped back so that uh, the French would have some some military force. You know, <laughs> these. Were, so you know, they, they, they there's not a lot of uh, military spirit there. <laughs> So you have all of these anarchist commonards. They said, "Listen, we are the the new uh, French government is cons conservative and isn't really meeting our needs. They're on their own. This is a large city, right. and they said, let's just organize our own affairs, which began the birth of the Paris Commune." That's right. That's right. That night after they realized that they weren't going to get be able to take the cannons back. And they ordered all the troops out. They also gave orders for all the police to leave the city. And the government itself left. Thiers, who was the, um, Adolphe Thiers was the man who had been elected. He was the, the head of that, of the government that had surrendered. Um, he gets, he's one of those in, in a carriage, in a sealed carriage, and they, they roll out of Paris and they go to Versailles, which is not very far away. It was a, you know, it was probably an hour and a half by carriage. Um, and um, the city then has nobody in charge. This is, you have to, this is the largest city in continental Europe, 2 million people with the complex uh, transportation system, healthcare, I mean, everything, <laughs> industry, you know, and there's nobody running anything except, but the workers are there. They, Ooh. The people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, but so once they, once they leave, well, then the, 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 the Central Committee of the National Guard says, okay, well, now we can actually proclaim a commune. We can declare that we have a commune. And wh what did the commune mean to them? Well, well one th for one thing, it was a reference to the first Paris Commune in 1792-93 in the, uh, in the, the, during the French Revolution, which was a very bloody affair. I mean, that commune sent a lot of people to the guillotine. Um, so that was, that was one reference. But, but what, the, what they really had in mind was, well, the commune is the people of Paris are going to run Paris. Now, by the people of Paris, they meant the adult males. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they never even considered votes for women. That was not that was not on the agenda at all. Um, but um, uh, but the, and the people the, the men then were going to be able to elect their leaders, and they decided that well everybody's going to be elected, and it since since everybody's elected. But it is chosen the choice of the people. The people can unelect them too. You can you can recall them at any time. So that was part of the rule. Um, and they but they held elections for the commune. So they they actually it took them a while to get all this together. But they actually managed to hold whole elections ten days after after the incident with the with the uh, cannon. That was March March eighteenth was the day of the cannon. March twenty eighth they actually. Held election, they, they proclaimed the commune. They declared the commune and they had elected members. Complete right. participatory democracy, everybody can yeah. vote. Right. And this is, and now it's, we're in charge and here we go. We're gonna reorganize right. our society here based on some, right. our, our, our rules that the working people are going to say are our rules. Right. Well, let me read, let me read to you what some of these rules were. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 this is a list that I got from various things. As I was reading, I'd write down these things. Separation of church and state. Right. Equal pay for men and women. women. Uh, okay, well, we, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay, that was, I'll come back. Uh, pensions for companions and children of dead soldiers. So they had some sort of social security uh, thing going on there. Requisition of empty homes for the homeless. And at right. that time, like one out of four people in Paris were indigent. You know, there was a lot of poverty, uh, according to the right. Merriman book, uh, and only one out of five homes had water in the home. So it was, you know, it was a lot of poverty in people in the city right. like then. Free schooling and legal services. 
recognizing, recognizing foreigners as full citizens, abolishing yeah. child labor and night work bakeries. That's an interesting one. You'll have to tell me about that. Free returns of pawn shops for all workers, tools, household items valued up to 20 francs pledged during the siege. Postpone of commercial debt obligations and the abolishment of interest on debts, yeah. student loans. Right of employers to take over and run an enterprise if they were deserted by its owners. So like a co uh, the workers could collectively take over things. Prohibitions yeah, yeah. of fine employee and fines imp imp imposed by workers and their mm -hmm. workmen. And then there's some even more of more of a, you know, women's rights. And so this, this is pretty liberal, well, progressive. Pat, Pat, all of those things that you listed were proposed and some of them were realized. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh, they didn't uh -huh. really have time to carry out everything. The, um, one, of the, one of the problematic things, uh, equal pay for, uh, for men and women was something that some of the men workers advocated very strongly, but many of them strongly opposed. Mm -hmm. Because there was a general idea, uh, very widespread among the workers, that the women were going to compete for wages with them. And so you didn't want you didn't want women working. Women should and a lot of them, a lot of them were influenced by Proudhon. And Proudhon insisted that that uh, women women should be in the house and men should be working. And the man's job was to take care of the woman. So she wasn't supposed to be working. So what is she, what's she supposed to do if, she, if she's single, if she, if, you know, if her husband has left her or, or he's been killed, as, as would happen as the war went on, um, you know, what was she supposed to do? Turn to prostitution? I mean, what, you know, what, what's the alternative? Um, so, uh, but that, but that was uh, the only, uh, industry in which that was actually made uh, a, a rule, equal pay, was teaching. Uh, so men and women who are teachers, teachers, uh, grade school, high school, uh, were, were supposed to get equal pay for equal work. In most of the other industries, you didn't have men and women working together. It was a man's industry or a woman's industry. Um, one of the exceptions was the industry I took as a basis in my novel, book binding. Um, one of the things that I, I, I learned as I worked on it, also I taught sociology for years. And I, I taught in uh, labor studies programs. I, I knew a lot of workers. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I was um, very, very concerned uh, about the, uh, the relationship between you know, men and women workers. And, and uh, in bookbinding, th this industry, which was growing very rapidly because the more people were literate, there was a market for it. And a, and a bookbinding workshop could have 20, 30, even 50 people in it. Uh, now, some of them would be working these huge presses they, they didn't print, they weren't pre presses for printing. They were presses for squeezing, you know, uh, pressing the book pages together, flattening them. And, you know, people would be like, you you'd get a bunch of the pages and somebody had to cut them uh, and trim them. And, you know, there were, there were many specialties within that industry. And one of them was the sewing. And those were usually women. So, so you have a group of, you have women and men working together in the, uh, in the workshop. Uh, but of course, their pay was based on their job, not their sex. And since so, so, so the job of sewing was a, was lower paid than the job of gilding. The guys who would put in the gold letters on the on the covers of the books or the gold on the uh, page edges. So, um, but uh, but in in teaching, they actually got equal pay. Well, and also you said that there were clubs, that there were a lot of these okay. clubs, and women were given standing and being able to speak at the clubs? Oh, was the women were very active in the clubs. We, uh, that's and, new, wasn't it? That was, that's kind of a new twist, wasn't it? Well, no, they had been, uh, women had been extremely active in the first French Revolution, 1789 too. 
uh, and women were on the barricades in 1848. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so no, women had always been involved. Um, they hadn't always been recognized as having authority or legitimacy in, in uh, politically, but, but no, the women had always been very much involved, the working class women. And, um, you know, but the, the women spoke out and, and for some of them, of course, this was a, a rare opportunity. People, there's a woman who had really strong opinions and she'd never had anybody but her coworkers to, to tell them to, and she'd get up on the podium. What they did was they took over the churches. And what they ended up doing, finally, they, uh, they actually didn't really total, they didn't befoul the churches. They took them over for that night. Then they, they turned them back to the priests for other times, other times, but, they, but, but uh, the church would be this, it had a big hall. It had a place for, for the speaker to stand, you know, and it was great for, uh, for a political rally. So, so yeah, correct me involved. here. I read my list and this is like a, progressives uh, constitution of, you know, t t today, if everything on this list was the, this is quite remarkable, but you're saying some of those things happen, some didn't happen, some right. were proposed, but it's still, this was a, a quite a remarkable um, departure from being ruled by the monarchs or being ruled by absolutely it was totally this, different. this was pretty radical wasn't it right that's right and there was, there was a, a festive air in france in paris uh the first days and they realized hey we're free right. you know we can do it you know and uh, you know they were they were dancing in the streets and <laughs> the music playing and, and it was there was a, a lot of joy um and and people were arguing, of course, all the time because uh, because some of them uh, there there weren't very many anybody we would call Marxists, but there were people who were members of the International, and then there were the Proudhonists who had this more conservative view, um, and then there were a whole lot of Blanquistes, followers of Auguste Blanqui, and Blanqui was a revolutionary who was wanted he, he was always advocating an insurrection. But he, at that time, he was under arrest. So he, he, he didn't even get to participate in the commune, but a lot of his followers were there and they were ready to agitate. They wanted, they thought the solution to everything was violence, <laughs> you know, take it over. <laughs> and, um, and then you had, the, you know, and, and a lot of the people in the international, at least some of them had the idea, well, no, what you need is people have a better sense of what we're doing. We, we, need, we need to make sure that all of our people understand what our goals are. So anyway, so so this this experiment uh -huh. and um, new social organization was evolving, and it was it went on for a couple of months, seventy two days. Seventy two days. And so it was a short period of time, but it it encompassed a lot of hope and and oh, um, romanticism, and it was a it was just this this spring of, of great, um, I, I yeah. guess, great renown when you, when you look back at it. And then what yeah. happened? Well, the uh, troops, the, the Versailles, the government that had taken refuge in Versailles uh, is very determined to take back Paris. Uh, and they were going to do this any way they could. Uh, and they're very careful to work on their troops. They didn't want anything like what had happened on March 18th to happen again. You know, they didn't want, want their, their soldiers turning their rifles upside down. <laughs> no, you, you, you so they, they, they screened them. And this is also in my novel. Um, I have a, uh, a police chief who is supposed to be checking on checking on the, on the soldiers and seeing who is reliable and who is not. Um, we want people, and we're, we're trying to encourage anti-Paris feeling, anti-Paris hostility. And we're, we're, not, we're not allowing the soldiers to read any of the newspapers from Paris. You can only read the newspapers that are published here in Versailles um, with our point of view. Uh, and we're, we're gonna be talking about atrocities by the communards and, and of course, nothing about anything bad that we're doing. And, 
the, uh, the people in Paris are so excited about their new power and they were so convinced that they could, they could just, they were gonna win that um, they decided to have a march on Versailles. They were gonna take Versailles. Uh, and this is, this is just a few weeks after, well, after, March 18th was the, was the day of the cannons. And by April 2nd, April 3rd, they get their, uh, their assault together. And they, they have three columns of great numbers of men um, with hardly any military preparation. Uh, not a lot of weapons. They had a few cannons that they were carrying with them. And they're going out along three different routes to converge on Versailles. Uh, and this was called the, the, the torrential attack. They were going to, and they were convinced they were going to be in Versailles that evening. Well, no. <laughs> um, several things happened. Uh, one of them is, oh, you know, and they hadn't even scouted the terrain. I mean, so they're going out there and they had this huge surprise, the cannons on top of, of a, a mountain that's just, just uh, to the west of Paris limits. They had thought, they were under the impression that that was their post, but no. And uh, cannons from up, up on top of this mountain start firing into the files of the troops. And this causes panic. They say, wait a minute, that's not, supposed to, that's not supposed to happen. Those are supposed to be our guys. What's going on? You know, that's treason. I mean, so, somebody betrayed us. You know, and there was panic. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, and, and some of their, their uh, best leaders, or the leaders that they had greatest confidence in, were killed during these two days. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible disaster for the country. And uh, mo most of the men do manage to get back to the walls of Paris. But that was the last time there was an actual attempt to seize Versailles. So they had to rethink, you know, well, okay, it's not going to be over this quickly. What are we going to do? Some of them thought, you know, I, I've often wondered what would have happened if the commune had survived. First of all, how could it possibly have survived? You have the, you have the Prussian army ringing the city on the north and the east. And you have these enemy French troops <coughs> on the other sides you know, bringing the city, bombarding. How could, how could, you know, would the Prussians have allowed it to, we don't know, we don't know, but what they hoped, what some of them expected was, first of all, they hoped that other cities would form communes and support them. Uh, they had great hopes for Lyon, Marseille, and several, several of those cities actually did form communes, but they didn't survive very long. Uh, the, and there were even attempts to uh, rally the peasantry. This was very hard because the interests of the French peasantry and the French proletariat were quite different. Um, I mean, the French peasantry, were, they were concerned about their own property and keeping their property. Uh, th that would have been a major struggle to, uh, to re-educate the, uh, the, the French peasantry. Uh, but so, but they're, they're locked in this city, and they have these this notion. What they what they wanted, they didn't want Paris to rule France. They wanted Paris to be the center of a whole ring of communes, and maybe not just France. Maybe maybe they're going to you know spread it, spread into Germany <laughs> and uh, other other places. Um, but that you know that was a, turned out oh, to be a fantasy. Okay, here's here's a stupid question. Commune and communist, is that where communist comes from, commune? Well, or, or, was, it, talking, or was it just a derivative, a Latin derivative that was a so I, I, think, I think the first well-known political actor to call himself a communist was Babeuf. And that was in the, during the great French revolution, 1789. And what did he mean by a communist? Well, he meant somebody, he, he was in favor of everything being held in commune, in, in common. Okay, um, okay. And, uh, Within the, within the uh, Paris Commune, 
some of the people, uh, sometimes they would, they would identify those, they would call themselves communist, they would call themselves communists. Just, but I mean, I mean, that just meant we were in favor of the commune. Uh, there, was, there was no communist party. Right, right. We really even imagined that. Um, there was a, um, uh, but, but the members of the international in particular. Uh, another thing is, um, at first the word communard was an insult because you know that suffix ard in french is a way is is um, belittling um, like the uh, bum, bums who used to sleep under the church bells were called clochard cloche is the bell and uh, the uh, the people who surrendered to the prussians were called capitulard the people people capitulators so communard was sort of a sort of a put down um, they call themselves communeux but then after a while, they just say, well, hell, now you're calling us communist. Sure, it would be communist. It was sort of like, like you know, Americans who used, to, who used to be called and sort of accepted being called Negroes to say, no, I'm black. You know, <laughs> you know you're going to call me that. I'm, 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 I'm proud of that. And they said, I'm, yeah, we're communists. So, so they, they, they adopted it. it. It was no longer a, an insulting term. So, but, so but, uh, but communist, uh, they didn't, did not usually call themselves communist. You'll, you'll find the word sometimes. Sometimes they'd use it, but. It's so just the, the, the defense was a little chaotic and then comes Bloody Week. Yeah. Uh, the, the, how, the French, what is, tell me about Bloody Week. Well, well, the defense is totally chaotic. If you've read the, the major history of this period is by a journalist, Lisa Garry. Uh, and uh, I, he appears briefly in my novel. Um, uh, he, I, I think, I think Lisa Garay was actually com in, in, in combat, and he was he was there until the very end. He somehow got away, and and put together his notes and interviews and did a huge job. But his huge complaint, and he was right, was the total military disorganization. I mean, you have a totally democratic armed force, the National Guard. The guys in the guard are electing their uh, their company leaders. Who are they electing? The guys they like, not necessarily anybody who knew anything about about uh, military anything, and and then and then the uh, then these these company leaders elect the uh, you know, the commander of the whole battalion. Fine, and the battalions, their their main loyalty is to their home neighborhood. Uh, and so, I mean, it, it becomes very hard to coordinate, to, to create a citywide strategy. They had a, a couple of generals who were very, very good. Uh, two of them were Polish, Dombrowski and Wroblewski. They were veterans of wars in Poland against Russia. And they were very much committed to what they understood to be the liberation of Paris and the liberation of Poland as well. Um, and you had uh, several Frenchmen, a man named Eudes, who was very good, another one named Saint-Cecilia. Saint um, and these guys had enough prestige that they could actually get their men to follow them and to stay together. But, but a lot of them times, you know, if the people say, well, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not gonna fight. You know, I, it, was, it was really hard to organize an effective defense. And the, and the poor guys who were on the, on the ramparts with the cannons firing back at the Versailles, because uh, the, the Versailles are bringing in their heavy cannons. Not only are they bringing their heavy cannons, they brought in naval guns and put them on boats on the Seine, on the river Seine, right through the middle of Paris, and they're firing from those. Um, anyway, these guys on the ramparts, the, the cannoneers, some of them were very good. But they're exposed. They're really exposed. A lot of them got killed, and and there's there's nobody to relieve them. They're, they're there for just too long. It was awful. Uh, and uh, but they, they carry on the defense for a very long time. I mean, 72 days under those conditions, it was pretty heroic. Uh, and then finally, on May 21st, it was very the, the the people in the commune were so confident that they would never be taken that their walls were gonna hold forever. Um, and they were making, they were meeting until the last days and they were making plans 
there, there, were, there were plans run up in the commune meetings for new reforms and uh, uh, including theatrical events. And they had a huge theatrical event at the same time that the Versailles troops broke into, into the city. They didn't know that because these people, they're all gathered in the, in the center of the city for this concert uh, by the orchestras of the, of the various National Guard battalions. And while this is going on, the, uh, the forces of Versailles are moving in to a, a point called Point du Jour, Point du Jour, which is a part of the walls that sort of sticks out uh, on the, uh, the extreme southwest of the city. And, and that had been bombarded mercilessly. The walls had been co almost completely destroyed. And there came a moment when they discovered it wasn't even defended. It wasn't even defended. And they enter and quickly uh, more and more troops enter and they, they flood into uh, Western Paris. Western Paris was the more bourgeois part. It was where, where a lot of the, these troops were actually welcomed by a lot of the citizens who didn't want to have anything to do with the commune. They wanted the commune to be over. Um, and so they, they take great sections of the Western part. Uh, Dombrovsky organizes a counterattack. It fails, and, you know, and, uh, um, but he survives that, at that time. Um, and uh, they keep in bringing more troops and they keep marching eastward toward the working class districts. Uh, the Prussians had signed that they were supposed to be neutral. They were not supposed to take either side, but they permitted the Versailles troops to enter the area that they held from the north. There weren't supposed to be any Versailles troops up there, up there in the north, but they, they entered and they came in and, and sort of like, and surprised the defenders coming in from, from that position and descending on Montmartre from the north. And, well, anyway, they- um, Started slaughtering people. Yeah, they, 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 yes, yes, it was huge, it was huge. The defense was, was uh, amazing and uh, um, they actually held back these people for a, a, a very long time. Uh, and finally, they, uh, one after another of the commanders of the, of the National Guard, they had lost. I mean, one, uh, one had been dismissed, another one had resigned in disgust because he, could, he couldn't get people to obey him, obey him. And finally, they ended up with a, they made the commander of the defense, like the Supreme Military Commander for the Commune, was a man named Delis Cluse, who was a journalist. He had no military experience. He probably didn't know how to fire a rifle. But um, uh, and but he was supposed to. But he he had prestige because he'd been a he was a well well known radical. Uh, he'd been a, an opponent of the emperor for years, and he was he he was what what they considered very old. I think he was sixty five or sixty six, which they considered him ancient. Um, and he issues a decree saying, "The time has come for all Parisians to defend. Go defend your quarter." Which was ridiculous. No, you don't. No, 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 no. You, you mean everybody's supposed to go into his neighborhood and fight? You know, you no, you need a coordinated defense. You got to stop these guys. No, no, everybody. And and that's that's basically what the last battles were in very local. But they they came in and literally lined people up and shot them against the wall. There were two twenty thousand people summarily, it, you know, this wasn't a, okay, surrender and we'll, you know, have prisoners. Right. This was just a massacre, correct? Yeah, right, 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 right. And, uh, and, it was, and if you had boots on that looked like you might've been National Guard or certain, right. certain professions that were more right. radical than others, they literally came through and just- Or if you had gunpowder stains, gun stains on your hand, it was, was a death certificate. Right, uh, right. So to, so what you had was this, this really romantic expression of people coming together and trying to make things better, ending in not only a um, military action, but a genocide in a way. I mean, this was a, this was. A, this they, they, was wanted to, yeah, they wanted to annihilate the commune. Right. 
and they did. Well, and, and so, it, it, and it was it was gone then. Well, in a sense, but as the song says, "Il n'est pas mort." She is not dead. She being the commune, uh, and of course, some people survive. Uh, people, a lot of people survive. Uh, not not as many as were killed, but and uh, the ideas survived, uh, and people came back, and people are still fighting for those things. So that's the interesting thing. I didn't realize that Karl Marx, a year, you know, that year was was writing about the commune. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote the working men's Paris with its commune will be forever celebrated as the glorious harbinger of a new society. Its martyrs are enshrined in the great heart of the working class. Uh, and he, he went on and on. So he, he took the red flag, you know, waving the red flag, if you will, and said, this, this was something that was important and the fact that it was destroyed so brutally um, rallied him and others to make this a symbol of of many struggles. The Yellow Vest, the you know Central America. You're familiar with with that. The Russian Revolution. All of this yes. used this. Didn't they use this as kind of a, uh, well, a well, red the, flag? The Paris, to... the Paris Commune was the only pattern Lenin had for creating the new society. It was the only example ever in the world of a modern industrial society actually run by workers. It had never happened anywhere else. Okay. You know? and so, and the legend has it that when the uh, October Revolution reached the 73rd day, one day longer than the country, uh, there are people who claim that uh, Lenin went out and danced in the snow. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, you're a, a resident uh, historian regarding Marx. What was your thoughts about his observations about why the commune worked, why it didn't work, and how he how he wrote about it? What are, what are your thoughts about that? Check, check, check this out. Yeah, that's I, I've got my version to hold up too. the uh, what is, uh, tell me about that. Paris Commune, the Civil War in France, Karl Marx and uh, Engels was inspired by it, Marx was inspired by it. Of course, as Jeff said, Lenin was inspired by it. In fact, uh, the lessons of the commune really set the stage for, uh, for communism, for, for radical socialism, for uh, Marxism in its mature moments in the 20th century. And uh, Marx drew one lesson that he and Engels began to draw in 1848 around the revolutions that occurred in 1848, but it was finalized. A final stamp was put on it, and that was that you could not take over a, the state. You could not take over the existing state and leave it intact. You had to smash that state and begin again and create a working class state. And that, of course, is the lesson that Lenin drew as well, and that became the, really the hallmark of uh, communism up to this this era, this time, I think. If you look at uh, China, there's plenty of people who argue that China is not socialist, that it is socialist, whatever. But one thing you cannot deny, and that is the state is uh, controlled by the Communist Party. The Communist Party is not going to surrender that state to, um, to other forces. And uh, that's the lesson that, uh, that Marx drew from, from the, the, the commune. I think it's interesting that in a recent Pew opinion poll, a majority of American people, and it's never been asked before, but they were asked, well, how would you feel about a, a referendum to recall all the politicians <laughs> any moment? A majority voted for that. That was the idea of the commune. I mean, that's, that idea is 150 years old in operation, and we right. never had anything like it. And in fact, it's also interesting to compare that revolution in 1871 with our own revolution in which what began as an independence movement with a democratic element in it that retreated as quickly as it could away from democracy. The whole idea of our constitution was designed to really make sure we didn't have rabble running the country. And uh -huh. in fact, the aptly named book of Jeff's 
rabble expresses just the opposite idea that we need radical democracy. We need that kind of democracy. That's what's missing in our world. And when you, when you, when you look at the fact that the upcoming election in this country, the interim elections, is projected to cost $9 billion, you have to ask yourself, what does that have to do with democracy? And you have to compare that with a rising in Paris, which where people were, direct, were, were elected by direct democracy and everyone had an equal shot at that. How far we've come in the wrong direction from, from uh, democratic ideals. Um, so, you know, my hope is that, you know, for a lot of people, uh, Paris Commune was the Woodstock of that era, you know. My hope is that like Woodstock, that maybe Rabble, the book Rabble, Maybe Oliver Stone or somebody else that has some power will pick it up and make a movie out of it. <laughs> Shocking with all the crappy movies that we have about events, the bio ops and so on, that we don't have a real honest version of, of the Paris Commune. I mean, it's exciting, just as Jeffrey relayed to us, what an exciting event. Well, yeah. and beginning to end, what an exciting event. What, what fascination with people taking things in their own hands and the symbolism of the Paris Commune is really what we draw from it. It, uh, it couldn't have won. I mean, Jeffrey's right. Countryside was agrarian more so than in the other capitalist countries, and they were not going to go along with this. Uh, but like a lot of things, like the 1680, 1381 uh, rising in, in England, uh, uh, John Ball and crew, when they almost took uh, London, which is another great movie if somebody could <laughs> But these things inspire people for years and years and years. And I think today the Paris Commune inspires people uh, again. I think it inspired Jeffrey to write his novel and it inspires me politically of what's possible. What's possible. Mm -hmm. People can rise to the occasion. People, people who had no experience running anything can learn how to do it. And they did. Uh, and they can pool their knowledge uh, one of the great examples was the uh, the, the postal service. Uh, the uh, the people running the running the postal service for Paris all fled, and not only that, but they destroyed the stamping machines and everything they could. And uh, and so uh, the, the man who was put in charge of the postal service he had no experience at all. He was a bronze carver. That was his that was his job his his profession, but. He knew how to talk to people. He talked to all the people who worked there, found out how the thing was supposed to run. How do you manage to get the mail delivery? And they actually resurrected a very efficient mail delivery system within the city. They couldn't get they couldn't get uh, letters out of this beyond the city. But but I mean that was just simply one example. Uh, it's an example that Lisa Garay uses because he became a personal friend of Albert Tez, who was the man who who did this. Um, uh, but 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 also in the other industries, the the, the bronze foundry, uh, and and um, I have in the book uh, attempts to organize the women in the, in the clothing industry, um, you know, and 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 electing one of the women to be in charge, you know, uh, and if a man works there, well, he has to take orders from that woman because she's the one in charge, you know. So, so Jeffrey, why the? Why the brutality against these people? It, it was like it all to me. It seems like it was almost an overreaction. I, the just the way in which they they pulled people out and shot them and mass graves. I, this was a this was not a a normal quote war. This seemed like it had a little bit more of a edge to it. I, I, am I correct with that or? I, I don't know that it was so unusual if you look at other war, war scenes. Um, but in the case of Paris, the officers in charge of the armed forces took the commune as a personal insult. Um, they were particularly offended by the existence of Dombrovsky, who was so gallant, he'd appear in his black horse and he wore a very simple uniform and they go, I got to get that bastard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Um, and um, but 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 also the fact that mere workers were opposing them and and the and also uh, a lot of them were very hostile to the city. Most of the troops were not city people. 
Very few of them came from large cities and none of them from Paris because they'd been screened. Um, and uh, uh, they were fed all kinds of garbage in the Versailles press and speeches by their commanders about the horrors of the Parisians and the women were all prostitutes, uh, the men were all savages and they were usually drunk and, uh, and, and they were all foreign and, and, and the leaders were all foreign. So Jeff, how long did it take you to write? How long did it take you to write this? Oh, that's not a fair question. <laughs> I mean, that could be uh, a lot I, of research to I, was thinking, I, was thinking, I, 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 I mean, my first impulse would be to say all my adult life, mm -hmm. because uh, I, I don't know when I first heard of the pet commune. I think I must have been in maybe my first or second years in college. And I, I read Marx, I read the Civil War in France, and I read Hobbesbaum, and I found that this is it's amazing. My God, this is huge. Wow. You know, and I kept, you know, and then I went on and did other things. I was in South America, I wrote other books and so on, but, but I kept thinking about this and kept thinking about the thing. And uh, how do I get into this novel? I think I wanted to talk about, and I remember my own days as being very, very involved in anti-war protests, uh, civil, civil rights, and, and uh, facing, facing police mobs. <laughs> and so <laughs> that kind of, I'd say, okay, let's say a 17 year old worker, what, what, what's going on in his mind? And let's make him a bookbinder. He's an apprentice bookbinder and he's an admirer of violin. So that was, that was where that came from. And so I said, mm -hmm. so I followed him and the girl he falls in love with who's also working in the same shop. And she's, she's already more radical than he is. So, you know, that, so that these, these people, th this gave me some kind of a structure. So well, I can, I can hardly wait, wait to read it. I feel like I've read the uh, nonfiction version in preparation for this podcast. And it'll be nice to get into the more emotional fiction version of this. And uh, you certainly have ability to, you're a great writer, Jeff, you really are. And mm -hmm. Uh, this is going to be exciting to to be picked up and taken to taken to, back to Paris 150 years ago. So I'm, well, I, I'm delighted. I've been delighted to talk to you and with your your interest and, and your your research and your knowledge, both of you. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm the kid that just crammed for the exam, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, my my knowledge might be fleeting. So thank you, thank you so much for. Um, spending this time and sharing your your knowledge and and bringing this part of a a world history to life in such a such a wonderful way and i just wish you luck with uh, many more novels uh, to, to come <laughs> well so. thank you thank you it's been it's been delightful talking with with yeah. you too great okay. to see you again great to all see right. you again goodbye yeah. bye you all thank you again bye.